Previously on AgentPalmer.com, Breaking the Chains is an easily digestible history of spaceflight before NASA, a track-by-track look at Guster's classic album Lost and Gone Forever, and this podcast's first clip show seems to have been well-received. This is The Palmer Files, episode 43, with Ilana Levine, host of Little Known Facts with Ilana Levine, a star of stage and screen. We discuss the magic of live performance, creative conversations, nervous energy, and so much more. Are you ready? Let's do the show. Welcome to the Palmer Files. I'm your host, Jason Sturchik, also known as Agent Palmer. And on this 43rd episode is Alana Levine, a stage and film actress whose own podcast, Little Known Facts with Alana Levine, is worth your time, especially if you listen to me every other week. We discuss her show during this episode, but know that it is a weekly show featuring artists and their journeys. And I assure you of the over 200 episodes, there is someone you know or whose work you enjoy among her guests. But enough about her show. Let's talk about what you are about to hear on this episode of this show. Of course, we talk about podcasting. It's what happens when podcasters get together. But we also talk about theater and live performance, creative conversations and demystifying success, passion projects, and much, much more. Before we get going, remember that if you want to discuss the episode as you listen or afterwards, you can tweet me at Agent Palmer, my guest, Ilana Levine at Ilana Levine, that's I-L-A-N-A-L-E-V-I-N-E, and this show at The Palmer Files. You can listen to Little Known Facts with Ilana Levine wherever you get your podcasts or visit littleknownfactspodcast.com. Don't forget, you can see all of my writings and rantings on agentpalmer.com and email can be sent to thepalmerfiles at gmail.com. So without further ado, quiet on the set, cue the music and showtime. Ilana, I will admit that even just as a periphery person, there is some, there is a magical place on the stage. And I say that because I was never on it. You have spent time on the stage and a lot of time talking to people that have performed on the stage. Why is the stage such a magical place? You know, that is such a great question. Uh, There is something about live performance. um, And, and obviously that's not just Broadway, that, that is so many different kinds of venues and so many different kinds of artists creating something. Um, But unlike, you know, I'll speak from my own perspective. When you are an actor doing film and television, you can be really um, committed to your performance and so pleased with your performance, or so you think. And you have, you have, or at least it felt like you did what you wanted to do. Let me let me just preface it by saying that. And then and then the director and the editor take over and sort of it's their vision of what the final piece of art that goes out into the world looks like. So from from a purely like ownership perspective of the work for better or worse, and there are so many mishaps that happen all the time on stage, of course, um, and you can't cut and start again, but it is one of the only places that the creator of whatever art is being made has 100% full ownership and accountability. So I, I will speak to the sort of when, when you say what what is it, there's certainly that from a performance standpoint, you fall, you know, you, you, you may you may raise the sword or die on the sword, but it's yours and it's never the same. It may be the same words and the same set, but every time a new audience comes into the community of the work you're creating, um, it's it's just alive and new in a different way. And it's so unpredictable. And, and so a, it never gets boring. B it's always challenging in new ways. 
And there's something about humans who, you know, we, and that's why this year, you know, we're speaking in March of 2021, this episode will live forever, obviously. We have been so isolated and so unable to come together as a community. Um, But there is something about not just being the performer, but I've had the experience where I start connecting to a person I'm sitting next to who is a complete stranger in the theater watching the same play or musical. And then suddenly we're having some kind of connected experience together because we are moved by by the same thing, even if our histories and stories and, and lives have nothing in common, you know, uh, on paper. So I, yeah, that is what comes to mind. I, 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 I'll be honest, I lost it a bit because I was a member of the crew in middle and high school, even through college. And then it just disappeared for me. Um, And I, I've never felt the need to go chase it again. Although, although I get just as nervous sitting down to do this podcast as I did on, on show nights. And I, this is mine. I mean, we talk about ownership, like this is mine and I get final edit and I still get butterflies sitting down with you or I, I've had some of my closest friends on as past guests. I'm still nervous. You know, part of it, I think about it is just in general, when we don't, know the outcome of something when we when we have maybe control of certain aspects of the thing but we don't know you know what it's going to be the butterflies i think are thrilling you're alive and and all of like every fiber of your body all of that energy is a because you care about the thing right you want it you want your guests to have a great experience you want it to be um something listeners get something out of in the end you want to do a good job I mean they're all the things that go into anything that we make but I think anytime I have that feeling in my body and I don't mean to romanticize it because nerves are a drag yeah um (laughs) but but I think it it for me, it always alerts me to, oh, you care about this. You're doing something that you care about and you want it to be good. And that makes sense to me. You know, you've done so many episodes. It makes sense to me that you would still feel that way each time because you don't know what's going to happen. So, oh, so, I, so, so does this mean you, so you've given me my out, right? Like, so when I don't get the butterflies, that's when it's time to hang up the microphone. It's time. Yeah. Or just that day. I don't know if you have to hang up the microphone, okay. but it means, but you know, even these passion projects, there are still days where it feels like you don't want to go to work, even though you choose to do it because your things are going on in your life. And this might not be the exact mood you're in. Um, or, or, you know, we still have our lives. We still have things that are getting in the way. Yeah. I mean, as a passion project goes between this and the blog, uh, you know, I, I recently rewrote my about page because mm. I hadn't done that. I can't remember when, and it was in rewriting it that I learned, learned like, and this is going to be one of those, like this coming November, I, my blog turns 10. Right. Wow. I can't say that I've been excited every time I've hit publish or excited every time I sat down to write, but looking back, like I'm excited. I still have it. Yeah. Um, but it is kind of weird that like, I've got a passion project that turns 10. Right. Like that's to me, that is so mind blowing because I've had multiple jobs or not had jobs. I've, I've had, like thing people and places come in and out of my life it's just so weird um but it you know it's mine right and i i it, it leads me to a question for you which is your podcast is yours and it could also go on in depth 10 years 20 years whatever it is it 
vastly different for you coming from just being an ownership over your part in a play or your part on on a on a show where now like you are the lead or co-lead i guess because you're guest right and and but you're also the the producer and the director like you are the alpha and the omega you are everything Mm -hmm. is that has that been an adjustment for you you know i started out in a theater company uh in new york city called naked angels that still lives and and has had a lot of um success in terms of its writers and actors and producers sort of growing and becoming sort of worldwide names. But when that company first started, we all, you know, I, I joined as an actress, but I did a million other things in terms of, you know, building this company and, and just wanting to be helpful in all sorts of ways, whether I was in the show or not. And so it was also an opportunity for those of us who did one thing professionally in this theater home that we created to try on all different sorts of hats or in and around the world of theater from producing to, you know, designing to directing to whatever it was you wanted to do or whatever gaps there were at any given time um, in our company. And early on, I realized the joy of having some aspect of control because as an actor, you have, there are so many things out of your control until you finally get the part that you get to do. And even then there's a lot, you know, someone else decides what you're wearing and someone else decides where you're standing. I mean, there's a lot of other people involved in the creation of that character, but I think I always, and I started producing really early on and I've produced some films. And so I, I found for me, um, it's really great to sort of get to have this thing that I get to control all these different aspects of. And also scheduling wise, I have a family and much of this podcast was born out of the desire to get to have really creative conversations with people I love to help demystify the the idea of who, who makes it and who doesn't sort of just to kind of constantly show people that even the 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 artists the sort of greatest artists of our generation kind of have all the same struggles even around the profession that someone starting out has and I mean this is I'll, I'll circle back to your specific question but this podcast when you talk about 10 years it's been almost four I had no intention someone came up to me and was like do you want to try this and I said yes and it was all very whimsical but I realized after t- over 20 years of, of being an actor and being in plays for that long, the number of stories I had heard, these really intimate stories in the dressing room, I just thought if I could share that kind of um, truth about an artist's life with other people, it was something I wish I had had when I first started. Um, you know, when I started out, there was no YouTube and there were no TED Talks and there wasn't access to, you know, people's inner thoughts and, and, and what it is to keep going in the face of tremendous adversity or why keep going in the face of tremendous adversity. Um, what is it that what is this burning desire to tell stories, which is what you began this podcast asking about? So I think. I don't know how long I'm going to keep doing it um, as long as there are people who are getting joy out of it and and are listening to it and getting something from it. It's a pretty joyous thing to do. It doesn't it doesn't um, keep me from doing anything else I need to do. And it carves out time every day for me to just focus on something that I I care a lot about. Um, And to connect with people, especially this year during the pandemic where we couldn't see each other, um, it kept these conversations going and I needed them selfishly. Well, that's part of it. I I look at actors in a general sense, but also professional creatives is what I will call. I, I look at them the same way I look at sports, professional sports figures, right? Because, you know, while I'm. I don't want to put podcasting on the same 
spectrum as say like a recording art like an actual recording artist or somebody who makes a a a, a movie for a studio or a, you know a, a television sitcom but i look at those people in a in a, in a way that well lots of people play we'll we'll use basketball lots of people play basketball in high school and then fewer of them play in college and then fewer of them go to wherever they go. Maybe they don't get drafted, but they, they go a semi pro route and they eventually maybe work their way up. And that's not dissimilar to some of the stories that have been told on your show where there are tons of people like me that were part of either on the stage or behind the scenes in middle and high school. And then there's fewer of them when they go to college and then what happens? Like, I, I just right. kind of, I just left, right? Like I, eh, I, you know, I came back. I, I, I see podcasting as me coming back to it. Like I'm, I, I ran a board 20 you know, decades ago yeah. for multiple actors on a sta- stage. Now I get to run one for me, right? Like it's so small, but I, I look at them in the same light and having gone down a road of, I don't know, I, I've always been a fan of the behind the scenes, uh, which is a, like a big part of your show. But yeah. I've I've read I've I've been a very big biography reader of late, especially autobiographies. Love it when it's just told from like the person telling their story, and it doesn't matter. Like professionals are are they they all have that same journey, and they maybe some seem easier than others. But you still got they, they all still have to put in the work. And I I keep going back to the same things. I always go back to baseball in the spring. I always go back to West Wing every couple of years and rewatch it. Like I, I am so much a creature of habit mm. that it's like comfort food. Yeah, it really is. And I I have to tell you, there I've been keeping track of like so you've collected some of my favorite actors from the television show ed you haven't got them all yet but i keep i'm like Ma, maybe she'll get um you, you've got a bunch michael ian black and john slattery and slattery yeah yep, yep yep and then i and west wing west wing a lot yeah yeah, yeah. i i and w- what's funny is i recently spent some time putting together like all of my comfort tv shows mm. um and maybe I'll write about it. Maybe I won't. But what I found out was there's an there's a period of time where NBC was clearly my network, <laughs> like bar none, because it had Scrubs, West Wing, and Ed all on concurrently. And I didn't realize that because some of these shows either I came to after the fact or, mm. um, but it amazes me that that's a thing i can take a look at and then i go down that rabbit hole of like all right well yeah i rewatched west wing but now i'm gonna go like let's let's see some interviews let's find out what else is we all want to know more i feel i I feel like that's the it's it it's kind of like the human nature like we all want to I don't know, find out how it works. It, it, maybe not to the extent of like, how does my car work? Um, I, I think <laughs> Although we all, some people, some really people love do car talk but, and uh, yeah, but we do want to pick and choose our battles. Right. So we come in and I go, well, I want to know more about John Slattery. So yeah, I've got a place for that. And yeah, I, I, I have my favorite actors, same as I have my favorite athletes. I don't, I don't think it's any different. Um, do, do you find similar stories when you talk to these people? Because obviously it is in that kind of pyramid way. Like everybody's got a a give or take, and I don't want to get political with public school and arts, but like give or take, everybody's got the same equal access relative, relatively equal access in high school and middle school. And then continuing it in a professional way everybody's got a similar story, right? Give or take. Well, you know, it's funny that you say that because I think generationally it, it, it changes because that definitely, if I look at my 
you know, like the Julianne Moores, the Slatteries, Alice and Janney, um, Uma Thurman, like I'm thinking of certain people who've been on the show who who are sort of around the same age, Alice, give or take a few years. Sure. Um, all of those people who were public school kids um, did have arts in their school. Julianne Moore was an army brat. And so for her, the thing that was amazing, whether she was, you know, whether her family was stationed overseas or in the U.S., Anywhere there was a theater department, she could meet people. So whether she was somewhere for a year or if they were stationed for for a number of years, it was sort of like, you know, the way some people find a poker game wherever (laughs) they are and speak the language of poker. Um, That was a place for her, a touchstone, um, because ironically or not, many actors are super shy in person and these characters are a place for them to hide. Um, or, or come alive without the self-consciousness that they have in their real lives. Um, and so theater, theater programs, the auditorium, you know, there are a number of people who talk to me about how even if they wandered into the uh, auditorium in their school by mistake, <laughs> and happened to like looking for the gym and ended up in the auditorium and started watching what was going on, suddenly whether they felt like they could do it or not, whether they decided they wanted to be backstage versus on stage, they saw a community of people being incredibly kind to each other um, and having a great time making something. But I, but in terms of the generational thing for, for the, you know, I have a lot of younger stars on my show also, um, And for them, you know, they didn't all have the kind of theater um, programs going on in their schools. Things have been funded, defunded significantly. Um, But then so they found it, you know, in their community theaters, you know, or wherever they found it. Um, But then YouTube becomes like an access, an entry point for a lot of younger. I mean, it's interesting how the Internet and technology has created a lot of opportunities and access to information and, and, um, you know, but a lot of those kids just started making video content on their own, not, not necessarily coming through theater. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm lucky enough that I lived, grew, I grew up close enough to New York city that Mm -hmm. there were middle high school and even college trips to New York city. And would you see a Broadway show? Most of the time, unless it was like, we're going to the uh, Statue of Liberty. The museum or whatever. Yeah. 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 Unless it was a museum. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we went to shows and I've in preparation for this particular conversation, I've been trying to see if I can remember any of those shows and I can't, like I, (laughs) I, I, I can't, I think. Like, I honestly believe one of them must have been fan of, of the opera. Sure. I, I think I would have remembered seeing Cats. And um, I would have remembered seeing Rent because I, while I wasn't the biggest theater slash musical nerd, I hung out with them. Yeah. So having, it. having never actually seen Rent on the stage or the screen, I still know way too many of the songs because we were when we were driving around, they That's would have the, it blasting course, in the car. Of course. Yeah. And and so I, I can't remember, but I do know that there is something special about live performance. And I go back to I started um I don't, I don't know what you would call it going down the rabbit hole of like classic shows. And in, in, in terms of like, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of biographies because most people will be like, well, so-and-so in really heavily influenced me. And then I go, Oh, well, I'm going to read that book next. Right. Like, right. Just, and I started to pay more attention to what shows influenced other shows. So I've been rewatching Rowan and Martin's laugh in. Right. I've and 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 now that the Muppets are on Disney Plus, the original Muppet show, 
having rewatched a good chunk of Rowan and Martin's laughing, I see where the Muppets stole some stuff from laughing yeah. and, right. and seeing, but, but, but I know those things were done live or, yeah. or live to an audience. You know, there yeah. was, there wasn't so much producing like that was almost live to tape basically. And it, you can feel it based on, you know, by comparing it to like a sitcom now, like where it's not live to tape or it's live to whoever's going to edit it. Right. And there's an energy and, and the biggest cliche for it is music, right? Like if we all record together, like it will feel different, but you, you notice I like, or maybe I'm paying more attention or because I've been consuming so much of this older media where it was live. Like I just feel it. I can tell like the moment it starts, there aren't all these cut takes like this is just done and it's performed. And my heart goes out to all those people. Cause I edit this show, not heavily, but I edit this show. And I think my butterflies would be a thousand times worse if I didn't know that I had a buffer. <laughs> you know, I, I, I would, I would venture to guess because I do, I, I did and will again, a lot of live podcast events, right? So there's, you can edit, obviously, the the final version before you put it onto, you know, Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all the places. But in the moment, um, it's a live conversation in front of a live audience. And I have to say that in some weird ways, those have needed the least amount of editing um, because there's something about having that audience there um, that makes you very conscious of the fact that whatever happens in the future, you can't edit it in front of them. <laughs> um, and I, and I really, you know, I, I think you might love it and it's, it's, you know, something you could put together where you are, but it, it was, it's incredibly fun. I mean, I think it's very comfortable for me cause I'm a stage actress. And so, doing these in front of an audience is not the strangest thing for me to do or the most uncomfortable, but it was um, super fun. I love doing that. And I do it a lot. Do you enjoy having the, like, cause obviously, I mean, it's fun you, to you, hear laughs. I well, mean, it's, it's fun to hear reactions and whatever the reaction do is. You, but do you play to the audience a little, like, I mean, okay. So you and I are having a conversation and it's just the two of us. Right. And yeah. you could play to an audience that doesn't exist. I mean, we know they're, you know, they're somebody's Future listening. listeners. Yeah. Um, but do you play when you're in a live podcast setting and there is an audience as a, you know, at some point there will be again, like, do you end up, you know, like, let's say, let's put us in that scenario. You're playing to me as, as the, the other part, but are you playing to the audience as a, as an entity when they're there differently? Um, that's a really good question. I wouldn't say playing to the audience in terms of like, not looking at each other as we speak and, you know, I, I would think of it like if you imagine a guest on a late night talk show, they're inclusive okay. of the audience. They are aware of the audience. Um, we do a Q&A at the end. So the audience gets, you know, their their time to be a part of the show in a very real way. Um, so I would I would say it's it's the closest thing to that, that that, you know, if if someone is on James Corden they are talking to James, but there may be something that happens in the audience or, or, you know, if you say I'm from Alabama and someone from the audience, you know, woo, go here, like, <laughs> you know, like it, you're not immune or, or ignoring of. So yes, I wouldn't say play too, but it's a very inclusive experience. Um, and, and that's the hope that people don't feel like they are an audience to the conversation. For me, the goal of, of the podcast and it's, only possible to a certain degree because people aren't literally having coffee <laughs> with you and me or whoever my guest is, sure. but that they should feel like there isn't a barrier. That's been my whole point, that there's no us and them, I've, that that's the vibe. I've, um, I feel that in my own show because I try not to do too much homework. 
because I don't want people to get confused. So if, I mean, the obvious example would be, um, I, you know, set you up as a, as someone who's been on the stage. Um, and obviously whatever I did in the, you know, pre show, um, like intro is what I do there, but I don't want people to assume, I, I don't want to assume knowledge that I know other people don't have just cause I did the homework, right? Like if you had a book and I read your book, I read it, but I try and put all of it out of my head. Cause I don't want to be like, well, when you were 10, what was that like? And have everybody who's listening, who hasn't read the book go, what do you mean when she was 10? Right. Cause I'm not going to assume you're going to explain it. I presume, I presume you're going to answer the question. And I've tried to find this balance of trying not to be dumb, but also doing some homework because I want the audience to feel included. But in that regard, I'm treating the audience as the person in the booth behind us at the coffee shop who's just like, well, this is a great conversation. I'm just going to stay here and keep eavesdropping on them. Right. Right. <laughs> it, exactly. Yeah. I And th- in, in that regard, it's one of the things I love about podcasting because they it's it's it it goes back to like what radio used to be i think um and if you're not if you're not looking for it or even if you are i mean you can find people yelling but i i just want stories yeah and also i, I mean i think it's so intimate you know having airpods or earbuds or however you listen or or even if it's just something you're listening to while you're cooking on your Alexa. Yeah. Um, it is, I, I think storytelling and, and podcasting as a form of storytelling, it's very comforting, you know? I mean, I think, you know, it, it goes back to when we were kids. It's a very familiar, soothing kind of way to, to, to take in stories and content. And, um, yeah, I feel so lucky to make one, I, I feel like I listened to them, you know, I listened to them before I started making one. I mean, there are 1 billion more now than there were at the time. Sure. Um, but I do feel like it's been a great addition to the entertainment and um, content world of content. I, I think it's a good thing. So when, when, were you approached to do your podcast? And and if so, right, like you had been listening to them, were you like, what am I going to do? I did. I did think that. And then I thought, you know, they tell new writers sort of write what you know when you're beginning. Um, and I thought, what what do I have access to? What do I feel at all like an expert in or as close to, you know, what have I put in my Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours of? And, and, and it's been uh, in the world of, of, you know, telling stories. And it, it all happened very organically. And, and John Slattery, who you mentioned earlier, is an old friend of mine. And right when I was sort of pitched to, to do a show and figure out what it was, I was with him and he's just so hilarious. He's just one of the best storytellers I know. And, and when you're starting something, it's hard, you know, this was going to be, as it turns out, it, a celebrity interview podcast from a different angle. Um, and, uh, he was very gracious and agreed to come on, even though there was no show and there was no one I could go, well, you know, Octavia Spencer was already on. Do you want, you know, there was no one. I said, I'm there. And, uh, and it, it was so much fun and it was so easy. I mean, I wasn't a stranger. I've done a million voiceovers. So, so it's, or or every time you do a film or movie, you do ADR, which is when you have to go back. And for, for those of you who haven't done it, you, if the sound quality wasn't good on the day of the shoot, you go in and you, you try to recreate your performance. And, I've done books on tape. So I've always loved the form of being an audio only actor when, when given the chance. So the technology part was not um, scary to me. 
Uh, and when we were done, Flattery was like, wow, you're like a female Howard Stern. And I thought that was the strangest thing. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what you mean. And he's like, I just felt like I didn't know where this was going to go, but I always felt safe and like I wanted to go on the ride with you. So I realized it wasn't necessarily the raunchy, crazy, yeah. <laughs> explicit stuff of Howard Stern, but just Howard is an incredible interviewer. Yeah. And so to be told early on, and man, I had a lot to learn still. So I appreciate his having said that, and it was quite a confidence booster, but it it, it took a while for me to kind of understand the narrative deeply. Um, but I appreciated that. And it was a wonderful compliment when I realized what he meant. <laughs> and it gave me some confidence to then ask the next person and the next person. And I just went through for the first hundred episodes. I think it was like all the casts I'd been a part of in shows. I mean, it, it, I've been doing this a long time <laughs> and I was in shows with a lot of people. So it it really kept itself going and then and then it got popular so then publicists would reach out to me to have their guests on and that opened up a world of people I didn't already know which was equally exciting do you get starstruck at all I don't get starstruck I get inspired what's been really fun is uh, over time and my listeners really wanted to be actors but I've been able to like bring in other creative people who don't just act who I love um, and so for me, I just feel like, how did you write that book? Like, whatever it is, I'm just like, it's just so exciting to me. I mean, I get crushes on everyone. I mean, especially hilarious people like Mike Birbiglia. There have just been people who've come on, and I'm the most happily married person to a brilliant actor, Dominic Famusa, who, if you look at his picture, he's really handsome. He's got all the things going for him. So it's not crushes in any way that are um, going to continue past the hour in the booth. But I just sit there like, I can't believe I'm here with Matthew Broderick, who's doing his Marlon Brando impression for me when Marlon had to have like an earwig in his ear <laughs> to be told his lo like, it's just hilarious. And um yeah, I, I just feel so grateful to be in the presence of people who are so willing to not do the typical late night prepackage. I'm promoting a specific movie, film or uh, film, television show or, or play or book, but just to kind of get back to their origin story and see where it goes and then to highlight this beautiful thing they've made that we're, we're you know, also talking about. See, I don't, I don't get crushes so much as I feel like oh, we're going to be friends for the next 20. Like I get like 20 minutes into a thing and I'm like, oh, we're going to be friends forever. And I, I know that that's not realistic. I, well, some I think of these people I've just, I mean. Some of these people I've just met. I know. I, I think that's a much better way to put it because Crush sort of has other... Yeah, other connotations. Ideas about it. Yeah. And I think that's exactly right. I think I feel like, how is it that we've just met and I feel like I've known you my whole life? I yeah. think it's more that. Yeah. No, it's, and, and, you know, I mean, going back to me being nervous, I, because I get nervous going into any recording, I don't get starstruck. Like I'm already, I'm already nervous enough. It, You're there, just trying to get your heart rate down. <laughs> there, it, it, it doesn't That's matter. Cool. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, My Fitbit's going to be like, oh, like okay, what's I going on? Don't want to have a heart attack i'm good yeah i get it i get it well it's been so fun talking to you i feel like i heard you on uh dark angel yes i would uh, yeah i was on yeah. dark angels of pretty freaks at at one point yes dark angels pretty freaks i love those guys and when they asked me to be on their show i i know that i heard you I know I knew the agent Palmer of it all from that. When you reached out to me, I was like, how do I, how do I know that? Um, so thank you for reaching out. I appreciate it all these years later to, to reconnect through them. Well, we're the sweetest. Absolutely. And, and, you know, back then I didn't even have my show. I mean, back then I was just, back then I was just an annoying listener who was sending anybody who would read them emails for their show. <laughs>
There you go. That's what I was doing. There you go. It worked out. I could have spoken to Alana for the next few hours. And in some episode recordings of this podcast, that is what happens. I bring the show to a close, stop recording, but keep talking, which to those of you who know me isn't a surprise. And to those of you who have been listening, it shouldn't be. But back to the episode that you just heard. Our connection is 100% due to Neil and Annalise of Dark Angels and Pretty Freaks. And while I do this show for the stories, as Alana does with hers, we both want to create community, which is where our overlap with Neil and Annalise started. Those two have created a community that is wholly their own. We should all be so lucky. And another thing, Alana spoke about the generational differences in journeys from first being a part of amateur theater to being on the stage on or off Broadway or lighting up a screen of some kind. With a little time to think on that, I believe it's not just in acting. I think generationally experiences vary more now than they ever did. The baby boomers had a fairly similar childhood to that of their parents and their parents and their parents. But Generation X had a childhood that was unique, as did millennials and zennials or whatever we're calling the youngest generation now. I will acknowledge that a good portion of those differences come from technology. As a member of the shoulder generation in between Gen X and Millennial, I can vouch for growing up with early technology of internet and computers, but because it wasn't widespread or even very powerful when compared to what existed for Millennials, I pretty much associate my growing up with Generation X. And while technology isn't the only thing that impacts our stories, it is the one constant. Even if you didn't have a computer in your house growing up, you remember having them in school at some point, or you remember your little sibling having them, and you didn't. Technology allows us to have clear delineations in time, but, and this is super unfortunate, as you heard Alana state, the arts in education also have a clear delineation. I grew up in a time when arts were being defunded, sure, but they weren't disappearing, and that is a big difference. Arts in education is important. Every year they get cut is another year that another study comes out saying how important they are. A study done by the Brookings Institution found that, quote, a substantial increase in arts educational experiences has remarkable impacts on students' academic, social, and emotional outcomes, end quote. And none of that should come as a shock. Unfortunately, a trope in American television is the school teacher or principal who attempts to fight the school board on standardized testing and make education about learning and not just regurgitating facts for a test that can make the school look good, making the case for comprehension over recollection. The other trope is the fight to keep funding for the band or the arts or theater. Of course, Being television, most of those schools can afford to allow the school board to make a fiscally poor decision because there aren't real-world repercussions. And most of the time, unfortunately, it is a poor financial decision to go against standardized testing or to keep funding the arts because test scores are like money. They talk. This isn't news, but if you want to help fight for arts education— I suggest taking a look at americansforthearts.org. The arts are important, not just to youth education, but it does start there. To borrow a quote from the West Wing in episode 6 of season 3, Toby is defending the NEA, the National Endowments for the Arts, to someone and says that, quote, There is a connection between progress of a society and progress in the arts. The age of Pericles was also the age of Phidias. The age of Lorenzo de' Medici was also the age of Leonardo da Vinci. The age of Elizabeth was the age of Shakespeare, end quote. And he's not wrong. So think about the importance of the arts in your life. And then think about what you are doing to ensure they are just as important to the next generation. Thank you for listening to The Palmer Files, episode 43. As a reminder, all links are available in the show notes, and now for the official business. The Palmer Files releases every two weeks on Tuesdays. If you're still listening, I encourage you to join the discussion. You can tweet me at Agent Palmer, my guest, Ilana Levine, at Ilana Levine, that's I-L-A-N-A-L-E-V-I-N-E, 
and this show at The Palmer Files. You can listen to Little Known Facts with Alana Levine wherever you get your podcasts or visit littleknownfactspodcast.com. Don't forget you can see all of my writings and rantings on agentpalmer.com and email can be sent to thepalmerfiles at gmail.com. Alana, do you have one final question for me? Can you remember, whether it's from middle school or high school, any of the plays or musicals that you were crew on? Okay, so I, okay, I high school, I remember we did. You know you look like you're in high school right now, just remembering. <laughs> I'm, t- I'm, t- I'm, like, I'm panicking. You suddenly, you look 14. <laughs> okay, go uh, ahead. High school, I believe we did high school. I did Shenandoah one year um, because specifically um, and, and, you know, this was the, the 90s. So we had just discovered the idea of a laptop portable computer. So there's a there's a scene where they're in a tent and we just had fun playing random sound effects that we found from the early Internet. During rehearsals, obviously not. But, yeah. Um, in college, I did um, the Crucible, and those are the, I I know I did others. I like I know there were others. Those are the only two those I can are the remember. Memorable ones. That's okay. Those are both. Those are both um, very popular shows. I I'll I'll say this. I remember the. I, I I don't remember much of the Crucible except how it ends. I like I remember more weight, right? Like I that I remember. And Shenandoah, I've tried to block out of my mind because I remember for months after the cast party, I still had the songs in my head. Right. Which that- is the it's why I always preferred plays to musicals. Because plays, like maybe you remember a line. Right. Musicals, those are in your head. That is why you have to do a lot of musicals so that as soon as one is over, you can move on to the next one. So that's so because I only did like three, that's why I would. That's all you got. That's all you got. But those are good ones. And I loved seeing your brain working so hard to go back there. I, I know somewhere in my house and I've been trying to like purge items and like clean and not go minimalist, but just get rid of stuff somewhere. Not Marie I, Kondo it. No, no, I couldn't go that far, but okay. I know somewhere and I didn't throw it away, but somewhere I have a thank you letter from a director from, it might be Shenandoah. I don't remember. Um, I'd have to look at the year and like correspond it with yearbooks, but I do know I did see over the course of like going through stuff, a thank you letter from, from, from way back when. It's a very gracious business. So I still remember a lot of thank yous. I still remember everybody. Like I'm yeah. not, I may not be in touch with them, but I still remember it. It. it I will say this. It, it's a brotherhood and a yeah. sisterhood. It's a family, yeah. whether you've yeah. done, whether you've just been behind or on, like I, I it, it's, it's in that way. It's just like sports where like, there's a common language. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I know. I miss it. I can't wait to get back to it when, uh, when we're, you know, we're back in theaters and, and public spaces in that way.